Welcome back, everyone. I am Cass Pianti, and I am here as usual with my partner in crime, Bennett Tomlin. How are you? I'm doing well, Cass. How are you? I'm doing good. Today, we are joined by a special guest, Sam Reynolds, a reporter at Blockworks. How are you? I'm great. Good to be here, jihadists. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that the RCMP and CSIS would be thrilled I'm on a jihadist podcast right now. <laughs> My lord. To give some frame of reference to why Sam is calling us jihadists, uh, it's because the general counsel of Tether spoke to Bloomberg and, yeah, called us jihadists. So that's where we're at. Um, but, Sam, today you are here to talk about an earlier time, an earlier history in, in Tether and your time, perhaps, in Taiwan and and how that, that has influenced your understanding of cryptocurrency and maybe just markets in general. Yeah, I mean, there is this Taiwan angle to Tether that I think has not gone reported enough just because, you know, Taiwan's not really a financial hub compared to Singapore and Hong Kong. And I was quite surprised to see that they had these holdings in Taiwan. And so you've been in Taiwan, did, did you say five or six years? Yeah, around six years. So right now I write for Blockworks. And before that, I was a market analyst for a firm called IDC, covering the exciting world of PCs and semiconductors. So TSMC and all that fun stuff. That I, that's actually becoming more and more important these days. It seems like everybody is talking about the souring relations of China and Taiwan and whether the U.S. will get involved precisely because of the semiconductors and other stuff that you're talking about. Well, let's just say there's a, as much FUD out there about TSMC and Taiwan and China as there is any one of these crypto topics. Um, Bennett, maybe you can give a little background on how you and I understand Tether being involved with Taiwan at all. Sure. My understanding is that a large portion of the reason they were starting out of Taiwan is because uh, JLVDV, the CEO of both Tether and Bitfinex, was a lecturer at NTU, National Taiwanese University, and was living in Taiwan when they started Bitfinex and Tether. Um, their initial bank accounts were several different Taiwanese banks, and that was where Tether was for their first several years. And S Sam, you've been there the whole time that, that Tether was on the island. What is your role in this and how, how do you connect to it in, in some way? For sure. So having been in Taiwan for so long, I know that the banks in Taiwan are not really user friendly. I mean, the banks that Tether was, were using, like Bank of Kaohsiung, they're stuck in the 1980s as far as like technology goes. So for foreigners, it's very hard to actually open an account in Taiwan. It's about a three hour process. So I was quite surprised back in 2016, 2017 about the rumors that Tether had these Taiwan accounts. I thought, what the hell? Like why, why here of all places? So I see this post on Reddit or Twitter or somewhere where people are doubting the provenance of one of these audits from Tether CPA in Taiwan. So I'm like, oh wow, I actually live not too far away from here. I think it was on the weekend sometime, a Sunday. So I get on a U-bike, which is uh, Taipei City's like public bike system, and I bike down there to this office, and using my broken Chinese, I tell the guard what's going on somewhat, and we go to the office, and sure enough, it's actually there. So it's not a matter of this was a fake CPA and a fake report. Those both exist. It's a matter of why exactly did Tether use these banks in Taiwan? I think that's a great question. And uh, I'm going to defer to you, Sam. Can you answer that question? Well, OK, so let's fast forward to 2021. And a report came out uh, about how the U.S. DOJ was probing Tether to see if it misled banks to, you know, its actual business. And the sort of blank spot in Tether's history is in Taiwan. And so you can put really two and two together if you know about Taiwanese banks. So until about 2018, uh, Taiwanese banks played very fast and loose with KYC AML. Uh, these were things that they didn't really care about so much. So in 2016, uh, the New York DFS actually fined 
Mega Bank, one of their major banks in Taiwan, $180 million for, and I quote, flagrant disregard of anti-money laundering laws involving transactions through their uh, Panama office that came through uh, New York. And in you know 2018, Mega Bank was fined once again and was told in no uncertain terms to improve its oversight of KYC AML laws. With that in mind, you can think about, well, okay, so what if these banks did not exactly know what stable coins are? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised because the whole financial sector in Taiwan is archaic. It's geriatric. I would think that a stable coin would be something that they wouldn't really know about or care about, but they would see the large volume of cash into their accounts and actually want that. I'm pretty sure that in March of 2017, when Tether was finally cut off by Wells Fargo, their correspondent bank in the United States, they had basically condensed all their accounts down to Mega Bank. And so that's why that stuck in my head when you mentioned Mega Bank, because I was under the impression that towards the end of Tether's time in Taiwan, that's where they were banking at. With Mega Bank, yeah. So it could be that um, their correspondent partners got wind of the U.S.'s investigation into, uh, you know, both Mega Bank and perhaps even Tether and some of the other money laundering things going on with this bank and decided to cut it off. And one of the victims from that was Tether. That just struck me when you were saying it. And the other part that was fascinating is you mentioned that Mega Bank got in trouble for funds coming specifically from their Panama office. And by March of 2017, when Tether finally got cut off, they were doing business with Crypto Capital Corp, of course, who was a Panamanian payments processor, which is an interesting little anecdote in that general context there. Yeah, definitely. It is an antidote. Um, you know, I, I wouldn't perhaps have enough evidence to say that this was what caused the fine in New York. Keep in mind that Taiwan has a collection of allies around South America. So Taiwan is you know, not a country in the eyes of the world, with the exception of a half dozen countries within South America and Africa. And they recognize Taipei uh, as the capital of the ROC or China because they are well paid for that service. So maybe that was involved somewhat here, that there, because of the relationship between uh, Taiwan and these countries, there was money laundering going on via Panama. That is one explanation. But you do raise a good point here, right? Crypto Capital Corp through Panama and then through New York, the timeline makes sense but it's not something to be certain about quite yet. No, certainly nothing definitive, but as you were saying it, a whole bunch of dates were lining up in my head. So is the banking system in Taiwan, since these two orders have come down, tightened up? Are they much more stringent with their know your customer and anti-money laundering policies at this point? Yes, to the point that it is a major pain to actually open an account. So in Taiwan, I bank with Citibank and to open an account there, it was a long process of just paperwork, passport copies, that kind of stuff. They asked about 15 times if I have a green card. Well, I'm from Canada, I'm not American, uh, so there's that. Um, so it's become so intense there for KYC AML that actually to do any sort of banking is difficult. Things like wire transfers, things like account openings, they're long and hard processes. Um, if you go online to any of the expat blogs within Taiwan, they'll all complain about this. People say that to bank in Taiwan compared to you know, the uh, US, Canada, or most of the EU is a long and painful process. One anecdote I have, for instance, is with my name at the bank in Taiwan, they have reversed my middle name, last name, and first name. Right, So to send a wire to myself in Taiwan, I have to spell a name incorrectly. And sometimes over here on this side, that gets corrected by a bank teller, then rejected over in Taipei as the name does not match. So it's just, it's stuff like that, that has as a product of you know, these new rules for KYC AML as a result of mega bank being fined by US regulators. That isn't to suggest, however, that uh, the fine wasn't for good reason. But do you think that all of this is what's led you to start covering crypto? And I, I can only assume I don't I don't know, but I assume utilizing crypto in your daily life. 
Well, I mean, I've always been into crypto passively since the birth of Bitcoin. But, you know, when I saw this go down in 2016, 2017, it definitely drew an interest uh, for me into crypto and some of the nefarious bad actors involved in the space. You know, that's not to say that I'm a no-coiner. I believe in the merits of cryptocurrency and digital assets. But there are a lot of bad actors in this space. And, you know, with Tether, because of its importance to the broader crypto ecosystem it has to be covered aggressively we can't just have this faith as some people do in tether and we can't you know call people tether truthers who ask questions about the company fundamentals right so can we call them jihadists <laughs> well i mean that was uncalled for uh i do i do find it interesting because i I think we also agree that Tether does need to be covered aggressively and that it is, you know, this large, I, I would suggest a very systemic risk in, in the entire system. But all of that got started back in, in Taiwan. And so the suggestion is here, and, and there's nothing to confirm or deny this, I, I would assume, but like the idea is that once Mega Bank was fined all of this money, that Wells Fargo decided it would be a good idea to drop the correspondent banking with them. Is that right? Yeah. So I think that the compliance team at Wells Fargo were well aware of the shenanigans going on in Mega Bank uh, within Taiwan and their uh, Panama office. And they wanted nothing to do with this. They wanted to disconnect themselves from this relationship. And a victim of that was Tether. I mean, but this goes back to the broader question here is, was Mega Bank aware of what Tether was and did Tether deceive them as part of the account opening? I mean, it would be hard not to ask questions given the size of their accounts. At the same time, though, given Mega Bank's history, it's also par for the course, too. And is this what the DOJ is probing? Because given the fact the US dollar is used universally around the world, the DOJ has this extraterritorial, you know, uh, mandate to go after crimes involving US dollars. So I think that we won't know that much until the DOJ will choose to uh, release something. I mean, I have tried to run some FOIs on this, but have gotten uh, just pushed back on it. But there are so many questions here about the Tether, Taiwan and Mega Bank relationship. Well, do can sorry, do either of you have the exact date on hand when when that kind of dropped when it had when the news hit that they had been dropped as a, a client? They, uh, they were cut off from correspondent banking towards the end of uh, March 2017 and filed a lawsuit against Wells Fargo at the beginning of April 2017. So while we suggest it's a lot of money in March of 2017, they had less than 50 million dollars. And that is I. It's a lot of money. I mean, it's more money than I'll ever have, but it's not ungodly amounts of money like we're talking about now. No, it's not. It, it, but for an account manager, this would be something that should raise some flags uh, from that. It certainly is not a record amount for the bank to have. And honestly, compared to Tether's current holdings, it is pale in comparison. Yeah, which is kind of my that's that's my point where it's like, I, I don't know if if it if it was getting flagged, what I'm taking away is that they might have known this, they might have seen that it could be an issue, and that they probably just skirted right on by without doing anything about it. I'm right. Is that well, one thing that would set off alarms within Taiwan is the fact that these accounts were controlled by a Hong Kong entity, Hong Kong will back then at least was not part of China. But in Taiwan, Chinese firms are quite restricted into how they can invest within Taiwan for obvious reasons, of course, right? Hong Kong has a bit more of a free reign because of their formerly autonomous nature. That being said, though, there are more steps to go through as a Hong Kong uh, company to open up uh, corporations in Taiwan or for Hong Kong people to uh, operate within Taiwan, right? So that could be an issue as well, is that regulators also saw what is effectively Hong Kong money as, at the time, you know, Tether was a Hong Kong corporation that would be leaving the US, uh, leaving Taiwan for the US. So that might have also raised some red flags as well. And that could have probably caused people to investigate and perhaps even tip off in the U.S. Wells Fargo, what was happening? Would it have raised uh, red flags if 
Tether was, for example, operating with a Taiwanese address because for a long time, their FinCEN registration was registered out of Taiwan, out of New Taipei City. And so it seems they likely had some amount of corporate structure set up there in Taiwan. Yes. However, on the Taiwanese side, they would have saw, saw through this, right? Because you could have this corporation set up in Taiwan, but it would be owned by probably a Hong Kong entity. Now, I don't suspect that they kept lots of the cash in accounts belonging to that Taiwan entity just because the tax rate in Taiwan is quite high in comparison. So one thing that surprised me here is that, you know, it's not a financial hub, Taiwan or Taipei, right? And part of that is because the tax rate is not that low in Taiwan, right? It's not high like in Canada or the US, but it's not Hong Kong or Singapore level. And lots of the uh, trust vehicles used to shelter capital in Hong Kong and Singapore just don't exist in Taiwan. Like most capital goes from Taiwan to Hong Kong to be sheltered or Singapore, but not the other way around. And you said that after the attestations from Top Sun CPAs came out, you went down and like confirmed that they had an actual office at the promised address, right? Yeah, so Top Sun's a real company. Uh, they exist on Fuxing North Road in uh, Taiwan. It's about uh, four blocks away from a bar called the Brass Monkey, a usual expat hangout. But no, it, it's a real CPA firm. Uh, there's no question about that. So the b idea that this was a, a fake document is not true. My personal argument was never that the CPA functionally didn't exist. My argument was more along the lines of what we see in the China hustle where you have like KPMG India or KPMG China and they're doing audits and attestations as though they're KPMG or as though they're some reliable uh, functional auditor and the reality on the ground is that like how much can you trust this person because it's probably a person. No, I wouldn't say that. Um, you know, there's not a culture of petty bribery for things like fake documents in Taiwan. And, you know, while the accounting laws can be pushed around and abused, they are quite strict. Like the regulator in Taiwan is very conservative. They have this insane paranoia about money laundering. And I just I don't see the auditor being of that nature and that quality. And the Top Sun documents were always strange to me as an outside Tether observer because they were for four months, December of 2016, January, February, and March of 2017. All four reports were created on the same day in May of 2017 and then were dated for release all in September of 2017, shortly after Tether had hired Friedman allegedly to provide a full financial audit. And so they always just seemed like such a strange set of documents for these four end of month attestations to all be performed on the same day, months after when they were testing for had passed. Um, and to be clear, they were attestations. They were not audits. Functionally, they, they might have called them audits, but they were not. That's correct. Yeah. So I can't speak about the dates. I mean, there could be a number of things to explain that there. Like perhaps... The date in question was when it was translated into English from Chinese. That's one angle. Uh, secondly, you know, within Taiwan, there's a culture of, I'm not going to say laziness, but there's people are a bit, you know, um, careless sometimes with documentation, right? So you'd be surprised about how casual some things are uh, involving documents that should be quite serious. I'm not going to subscribe to the angle that because of the dates on there that it was adulterated or otherwise uh, dishonest documents. I will say, though, that you have to understand the uh, internal corporate culture at most Taiwanese firms, which would come off to a Westerner as a bit careless. Yeah. And my intuition is that you're probably right about the September date, that they were initially commissioned in May. They did the four reports then. And then finally in September, they realized they had to appease some of their English speaking critics and so had them translated in September. I think you're probably right about that. Yeah. So if you, if you can find those Chinese documents, that's a different story, right? Because how, you know, the law works within Taiwan is that as Chinese is the country's language, 
documents of that nature would be in Chinese first, uh, not English. And if there are differences, the version in Chinese prevails. So yeah, so for things like employment contracts, uh, you know, I've got experience there where there were mistranslations once in one of my employment contracts over there. And the version I had in English said one thing and Chinese the other thing. And uh, it turned out there was a difference that I was not happy about. But they said, well, you signed this as well. So... So I think we're both we're all under the assumption that that Tether's Taiwan days are are long, long dead. We're also, I think, clear that Taiwan has cleaned up its act. But what is the take away here for listeners in terms of I, I we're see what we've seen from Tether since then, I think has actually been a lot more opaque. If it if we had gotten those kind of even attestations, they're not audits, you know, if, if they'd gotten every month in attestation after that, uh, I think it, we'd be talking about a different story right now. But lo and behold, um, we know one of their banks where, what is it, 15% of their money is held or something like that. So uh, what are what's your takeaway since Tether has abandoned Taiwan? Well, the takeaway here is that the Tether question is not yet answered yet. Um, so my personal belief is that this US DOJ probe will unveil a lot more about their earlier days and their connections to Taiwan. And honestly, my you know takeaway here is that keep on digging, that as an organization, Tether is opaque. And the problem with that opaqueness is that there are so many questions just not answered about the company. And I just think that eventually we will see more in the form of uh, subpoenas, in the form of releases from the government. But the, the Tether saga is nowhere near concluded. And I just want to add before we move on that we say Tether has abandoned their days in Taiwan, but nominally, like in their registration with the Treasury for FinCEN, they still claim to be operating out of Taiwan. And so they no longer bank there. We don't believe they have much of an operational presence there, but that's still where they represent to the U.S. government that they are operating out of. Which would be interesting. Um, I think that's also perhaps an insurance policy on their part, because given the continued tension between the U.S. and China, I think we'll see more and more sanctions on Hong Kong firms and entities. And perhaps this is a way to not be caught up in the crossfire. That's an interesting take. Yeah, I haven't considered that at all. Do you foresee a uh, kind of abandonment of Hong Kong as a offshore haven? <laughs> Uh, I would see that its importance in the offshore world become lessened as people don't trust their autonomy anymore. So right now, theoretically, Hong Kong does have an autonomous court system that is largely staffed by both local and foreign judges. The idea being with that is you have confidence in their integrity as impartial uh, judges, given the fact that they aren't tied to the CCP or Beijing, but that is shifting and it's changing in direction. So of course, Hong Kong will always be Hong Kong. There will still be the need for a pipeline of capital into China because of the lack of liquidity of the RMB overseas. But will Hong Kong be this international financial hub in 25 years? I don't think so. Will it be a local financial hub? Yeah, sure. But again, going back to the Taiwan angle with FinCEN and Tether, you might question, well, why not move this to Singapore? Why not move it elsewhere? I think they still are banking as well on regulators not being as sharp in Taiwan towards crypto as they are in Singapore. Because Singapore does have a pretty comprehensive framework about crypto and they have very sharp people working at their uh, regulator, MAS. In Taiwan, it's not that they aren't intelligent people, it's just that they aren't as well equipped and resourced as their counterparts in Singapore. So if they moved to Singapore, I think they would be flagged pretty quickly. But in Taiwan's case, it's not on their radar because regulators often look towards China as a source of money laundering and financial problems in the country with illegal investments. And this is just not their concern right now. Is there no focus on crypto in Taiwan because it's not widely adopted at all? People aren't buying and selling it in volume. People aren't trading with it. Um, or is this some sort of uh, 
naivete from governance? Like, what 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 is this about? Well, well, to your point, I mean, people in Taiwan, they do trade crypto quite actively. So there's an exchange called MyCoin that does, you know, have a very active uh, board, a very active exchange. And they have gotten clearance from uh, the FSC, the financial regulator in Taiwan to operate. So you can use your local account and wire, you know, fiat into their account. So it's not like there's no interest in uh, crypto within Taiwan. I think the sophistication of capital markets is not quite there compared to Singapore or Hong Kong. So it's just it's not mainstream, if I want to say that. Um, but secondly, like their concern is infiltration into uh, Taiwan by China. So there's a case earlier this year where a actually a Bitcoin uh, miner, check this, but a major Bitcoin miner in China was setting up shell corporations in Taiwan via, uh, I believe it was Hong Kong, to try and recruit talent to work for things like AI, um, you know, making chips, that kind of stuff. And Taiwan views semiconductors as a key industry where investment from China is heavily, heavily regulated. And the police there busted this, they shut it down. But it kind of shows that this is their concern right now. That's their focus. So as a regulator that has finite resources, I don't think crypto is on the radar. I think it's stuff like this. So there's a common narrative that surrounds Tether that part of its demand comes from people on the Chinese mainland who want to use it for capital flight. Would Tether's usage as a capital flight instrument for people on the Chinese mainland make it more or less likely to draw the attention of regulators in Taiwan? That's a great question. I think it would, but the capital flight from China in that regard is not going to Taiwan. Because while within China, you can't connect your account at the bank to uh, Hubei or Binance, there are existing OTC desks, peer-to-peer -peer desks, where you can you know, very easily buy with your RMB uh, some Tether. But that's not headed towards Taiwan, and that's going places like uh, the U.S. or Vancouver to buy real estate, stuff like that. Because in Taiwan, uh, it's quite hard for a Chinese national to buy real estate. So their investment opportunities there are limited. Sam, on that note, is there anything you, any topic you particularly want us to t talk about that we've kind of missed entirely so far or any anything you'd like to comment on? Well, I mean, I think one topic could be how the common narrative right now is that crypto is illegal in China. That's not correct. Cryptocurrency exchanges are under securities law, but the better word for it would be perhaps a legal. Why? Because uh, what they've done in China is they don't define crypto within their law. And as a country that uses civil code, you have to have everything defined you know, on text for it to be used in the legal system. So it's not illegal. It's just illegal. Like people still actively trade on OTC desks. But I think the narrative that it is illegal in China has gone misreported. Do you think that's being reported just because a mistranslation? Or do you think it's being reported just because of clickbait of China bans crypto again? Or or what? Well, I think AMB. I mean, the whole narrative of uh, China bans crypto is great for traffic. That's clear. Secondly, it's also mistranslation, because I, I think that the under how you understand the law in uh, the West is different from China. Like in the West, we have common law, which is uh, precedent based, whereas in uh, China and also in a place like Germany or France, it's civil code. And just that nuance is lost, I believe, on people. Can you comment on that? Well, well yeah. So um, I mentioned earlier that within civil code, you have to have everything defined, like, uh, you know, murder, manslaughter, uh, security, stocks, loans, these all have a definition. And the criticism of civil code versus common law broadly is that you don't have room for 
judges to make decisions that will help evolve the understanding of the law, right? So in the West, you know, the concept of securities has evolved, uh, you know, eventually. And also things like uh, manslaughter and murder and all, all these legal terms. But, you know, in, in China and other civil code countries, and realize that China uses Germanic civil code for the foundation of its law, if you don't have something defined in the law, right, it can't be used within the law to resolve conflicts. Like if we were in China, for instance, and I accused you of running a scam with crypto and taking my crypto, I would have no recourse uh, via the court system because crypto is not understood by the court system. It's like trying to uh, write JavaScript when the computer expects you to write C++, right? It's just not going to work. And it doesn't mean that it's illegal. It just means that it's not legal. It's illegal. So I think that the narrative of China bans crypto is quite convenient and it gets for good headlines. But it just comes from a point of not understanding how the law works there. So like the reality then would be that right now the exchanges and stuff can't operate because they don't have a legal framework in which they can legally offer these but the citizens can still use crypto and it seems like the OTC desks and stuff are still functioning. Yeah, so if you check the volume on different OTC desks for Tether and RMB, it's you know alive and well. And a few weeks ago when the news first broke, there was some fluctuations, but you know it's come back to the point where it effectively mirrors the exchange rates of USD to RMB. Uh, so it's simple like that. And we have seen a brain drain to Singapore from China, right? Like these exchanges see that the market is becoming more and more hostile and have chosen to pack up and go to Singapore. But you can still, as a Chinese national, trade crypto, right? So they might not accept your uh, cell number from China, but you just use one from Hong Kong or Singapore. Like we all have a thousand SIM cards for travel and that works just fine. I'm confused because I'm running under the assumption that there's been plenty of court cases or, I mean, here's a, a great example is Zhao Dong is in prison right now as we speak on the mainland for cri crypto related crimes, money, money laundering and bank fraud, I guess. But like, is that just because he was moving RMB? Does that have nothing to do with cryptocurrency? Well, I'm not, so that case I'm not quite familiar with ex to a large extent. However, you know, there is still the issue that you can't have, um, so crypto exchanges would fall under the purview of unlicensed securities. So that's going to be one thing. And secondly, there's the good old fashioned fiat angle as well. So if he was, you know, transferring large sums of currency across borders without proper declarations, that's money laundering. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah. Bennett, anything else? No? All right. Um, well, Sam, that was uh, enlightening. So I appreciate, I appreciate you coming on and talking to us about that. Yeah, that was lots of fun. And as always, like, keep digging into Tether. Uh, the questions are still there, and we don't really know the answers yet. Yeah, uh, and I think that's, that, that's good advice for a lot of journalists who are probably only just starting recently on the tether journey sam it has been a pleasure yes okay let's go wage some jihad right now <laughs> <laughs>